Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Buck Haberichter, Managing Editor of the War Room. For those of you that haven't heard Episode 1 of this three-part series, I'll recap. Every U.S. student in the resident course at the U.S. Army War College has to complete a strategic research project as a requirement of the master's degree they are awarded upon graduation. Students typically do that as an individual effort, but a portion of the student body participates in integrated research projects. Typically broader in scope, the IRP combines the work of multiple students in a single, larger document that capitalizes on the breadth of experience of the entire research team. A little over two years ago, we sat down with the students and advisors of integrated research project number six. Their task was to examine leadership development requirements in the multi-domain operations environment in the year 2040. Due to a hardware malfunction, We thought we had lost the recordings of these conversations, but just recently we were able to recover the files. Despite a couple of dated references, we felt that this topic was important enough and of interest to our listeners that we needed to post this three-part series. Today's episode is part two in the series. Last episode, we began the discussion by trying to define and describe the world in 2040 and postulate what changes society would encounter over the next 20 years. In this episode, my guests will examine how the military has traditionally developed leaders and current trends in that arena. Joining me in the studio again is Lieutenant Colonel Retired Greg Hillebrand, and new to the studio Colonel Jason Schmidt and Colonel Retired Rick O'Donnell. A distinguished graduate of the AY-19 resident class at the U.S. Army War College, Colonel Schmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He has served in staff and command positions throughout the DOD, including Headquarters Air Force, the Joint Staff, the Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and United States Strategic Command, where he is currently the Director of Human Capital Directorate. Colonel Retired Rick O'Donnell was previously the Director of Land Power Concepts, Doctrine, and Wargaming at the Center for Strategic Leadership. He is a Senior Analyst for the Emerging Concepts and Doctrine Department at the U.S. Army War College. And Lieutenant Colonel Retired Greg Hillebrand is currently an Assistant Professor at the Center for Strategic Leadership at the U.S. Army War College. He previously served as Military Analyst in Space and Cyberspace, as well as a Faculty Member in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations. His Air Force career was primarily focused in the space and missile operations community. He is the primary advisor for the IRP. Gentlemen, welcome to the studio. Thank Thank you. How are you? Well, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, So yesterday we we did a a nice job, or at least in the last episode, we did a very nice job of of defining what the the environment looks like, we think, in 2040, or at least postulating that, as I said, uh, and its impact on multi-domain operations. So why is it we're so concerned about leader development and that being an important part of this problem? Our research project was looking at leader development across the spectrum. So we're not just talking about senior leaders. We're talking about all leaders within the the military environment, looking at senior leader development in the year 2040 through this lens of multi-domain operations. So using good Army War College design methodology, we wanted to both understand the environment, which will be 2040, and multi-domain operations is kind of what we talked about last time. But we also wanted to understand how the Army creates leaders today. And there's a spectrum there. How do they recruit? How do they create? How do they take that raw material and make it into a successful leader? And then how do they retain those leaders? And the creation process is not a point event. It's part of our study looked at this is an ongoing, continual from when a person is is joins the military right up to the point where they leave, there's development taking place. So in order to dis- understand what the Army and the military needs to do to prepare leaders for 2040, we have to have some sense of what the Army and, and the military in general does to create leaders today. It's glad you talked about that, Greg. I mean, straight out of the NDS, the National Defense Strategy, it states that the creativity and talent of the American warfighter is our greatest enduring strength. And I think as we compete in this uh, new world of of global power competition, we need to be able to acquire, again, develop and retain those leaders that will be critical uh, for success. Um, That's always a question when you have an all-volunteer force, and, and how do you get the force that you need? 
you know, initially when uh, we started developing leaders, I think West Point came along and, and they developed engineers when they were established. And those engineers came about not a, to necessarily be leaders within the Army, but to uh, relieve the Army from the services of foreign officers to to build bridges and, and roads and maintain that stuff um, prior to the Civil War. It was uh, during that period, though, that they realized that they didn't have the skills needed maybe to succeed in the battlefield, and a lot of the training was happening throughout the camps and, and, and you know, encouraged the Army to transform how it was developing developing its, its forces and its troops. Uh, eventually, you know, through the um, mid-19, the interwar years, the Army introduced uh, athletics as being a critical role to its leader development. And later on, it, it, it brought in um, leadership traits that, that we now talk about today. Um, as the DOD is the largest employer within the, the government, it employs roughly 1.2 million active duty troops. It, it has to have a um, recruiting strategy that is able to compete with others and uh, be aggressive to meet its goal. It was unfortunate that it did not meet its goal last year. Um, the Army will talk about that, you know, it still was able to recruit 70,000 soldiers. However, they also talk about they were able to do that with 10,000 recruiters. You know, that that's great that you brought in, you know, 70,000 folks. However, that's seven seven recruits for every, every one recruiter. And I don't know if that was a positive return on investment. Um, as the Army continues to recruit leaders of the future, we'll have to look at, uh, how it does that and if it will continue to use brick and mortar um, institutions to, to do what it needs to do. So, all right, that's, that's all in the here and now at the moment. So w based on your study of MDO in 2040, uh, how will future leaders need to be developed for them to be successful on the battlefield? Yeah, I mean, so right now when we talk about leadership development, there, there's three aspects of that. And uh, uh, Joint Publication 1 talks about education, training, and, and lessons learned. And education are those things that, you know, as far as professional military education, the things that we're doing right now at the Army War College is one year away from our uh, core function to, to get developed and to learn about leadership skills required of at the strategic level. There's also training, and those training are training exercises and scenarios that can happen in the field or back at a home station in, a, in an office or, or wherever someone c conducts those activities. And there's also lessons learned, which is really looking back on the experiences um, to improve upon what you've done so that you don't make those same mistakes in the future. Um, that's how JP1 defines you know, leader development. But the Army itself looks at it more, I think, through Field Manual 6-22 and, and how do they develop leaders. And there's, there's 10 core competencies that they introduce. And I don't want to list them off uh, in, you know, individually, but in, in a nutshell, it's about you know, being able to lead others, being able to be trustful, being able to communicate, and uh, being able to prepare yourself and pre prepare others. Um, those key competencies, you could argue, have been enduring over time. And uh, as we continue this study, it's to really determined if those key competencies are what's going to be critical going forward into MDO in 2040. Our study struggled with this. Leadership is leadership. Uh, it, it goes back to the first person to pick up a rock and fight was leading other people picking up rocks and fighting. This is an eternal thing, and it does not change. Now, as we mentioned, West Point focused on creating technicians, engineers, cannoneers, kind of a, a technical skill. Over time, they changed that, added sports, added other things. West Point continues to evolve and change because the needs of what a senior officer or any leader in the military does continues to evolve. Uh, General Lee had a quote, the biggest mistake of my life was taking a military education. I'm not sure we can afford to have that anymore. A military education needs to address all of the things that a leader does. And although leadership is perhaps eternal, the kind of things that military leaders do continues to change. A pre-Civil War leader may have the toughest part of that person's job was probably building bridges and building roads. Today's military person, the toughest job may be working with contractors and foreign nationals to build a bridge and to build a road in some country. But that requires... Um, uh, uh, competency in other cultures, competency in finance, competency in engineering, competency in leader. The, the list goes on and on. I think what's interesting about the, the General Lee example and the quote is that I think General Lee kind of falls under that theory of that leaders are born and not made. And that's not something that, that we can fall back on as a service or as an army. We need to understand that there's, there's other leadership models that we have to follow, maybe a situational leadership theory that leaders will need to adapt to their environment and be able to overcome the experiences to, to thrive. If we can continually wait for that great man, then we'll be behind and, and, and lose that competitive edge. Okay, so I feel like I'm a little bit in 
running oral comps here again with some of my questions, but I, why not continue? Uh, you didn't list the 10 competencies, and that's okay. I don't need you to list them all. I'm sure you know them. Uh, out of those, what, what do you think is the most important leadership company that, that has to be developed for future Batterfield? I think what's the most important, though, is the, are the ones that are not here for the future. And the ones that aren't here talk about the ability to thrive and in, in excel in a technological environment that is fast-paced and evolving and adapting in the future. Uh, and that's not listed here, and that's unfortunate. What also is not listed here is the ability of a future leader to strive in more of a environment that, that's, that's joint-minded that can span all five domains. Again, not listed here. And those are things that as we look into the the future recommendations of where our work's going to finalize, that's probably stuff that, that you'll see of where we need to focus on for the future. Leaders will need to be courageous. Leaders will need to have character. Those elements, I think, are eternal. But uh, as Colin Powell said, experts often possess more data than judgment. And I think the future has more and more data. So this ability to judge, this ability to ask questions, it's not necessarily part of what we structure as leadership characteristics today, but I think that will become more and more impo important. Yeah, you mentioned the comps, and one of the trickiest questions I got during my, my oral comp that I took was, do you think the Army values thinking? Um, and that was asked by an Army professor. And I thought it was kind of a trick question, and I just sit there and actually, I hate to say think about it, but think about it. Um, being at the school here, learning about strategic leadership and creative thinking and, and all those systems thinking and the things that we valued here in the, in the course, um, I couldn't give him a definite answer. That was something that the Army values. I think it values that um, thinking in this school, and I think it values it at the strategic level. But when my peers are coming, they're talking about how much they have to do for their physical training, um, all the things they, uh, accoutrements they wear on their uniform, the artifacts that are seen before them. I'm not sure if the Army values thinking at the tactical or operational level um, because I don't know if that's something that they need at that level to get done. I think it's more about uh, growing a force that can follow an order versus think about how to do the order better. Do you think that the Air Force or the Navy or the Marine Corps views thinking differently? That's a great question. And I, and I want to say I'm biased here, so it's not fair for me to say that. We should note that most of us are Air Force here, yeah. even though we're at the Army War College. And, and I'm going to say, I'm going to answer that with a yes. And I'm gonna, my answer on that yes is going to be because I think we promote innovation and we allow an avenue for, for our airmen to be more innovative. I mean, just last week at, um, at a conference down in San Antonio, we had airmen pitching new ideas to Mark Cuban, the Secretary of the Air Force, and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And I think we provide an environment that allows them to garner new ideas and smarter and better ways to harness um, the cognitive abilities of our young airmen so that we can get the best bang of our buck. So just as an aside, we had, and I won't name who it was, we had a senior leader out of the Air Force uh, leadership come through, and his comment was that he had questioned someone about who he thought was the most, someone external to the Air Force, as to who they thought was the most uh, innovative service, and the response was, well, the Air Force is in last place, because we've become so stuck in our ways in many ways. Yeah, exactly, and I think my own bias has me saying, well, there's no way, it's impossible. Um, it, it, I think it's hard, I think we've been forced to be the most innovative service because we're well, the smallest, well, besides the Marine Corps, um, but also due to the budget cuts we've taken and the, the downsizing in the force population that we've inf incurred on ourselves to, to modernize has forced us to generate a force that can, that can think innovatively and outside the box. As a space operator, I'm looking forward to a separate Space Force, which will clearly be the most innovative of all the services. Again, we don't have time for that in this podcast. <clears throat> so uh, moving along... Um, you know, anytime we introduce major change in any of our services, uh, there are always those that, that plant steady and they don't want to move off that position. What do you say to the people that, that would tell you that we already have the tools we need in terms of leader development and those will carry us through to the future of 2040? Uh, I don't believe there's a single piece of doctrine that exists today that would support that. I think everywhere you look around you, whether it's in the business world, the sports world, or, or the military world, if you are not changing, you risk being irre irrelevant. And, and quite frankly, the folks that believe that what we've done in the past will get us into the future, it's just not supported by any reasonable thought. There's, there's no part of the world that's moving at the same speed, nor at which the complexity is getting anything but more. So I think for those folks who want to believe that uh, what we have in place will carry the day in the future, I, I'd say get outside and just look around you. 
Okay, so I often have the discussion in class with my students. We talk about the idea of VUCA, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, and uh, we've had many debates here on on uh, War Room itself, or on a better piece, I should say, uh, about the value of VUCA and whether or not it's worthwhile. But I, I talk about it in terms of looking across time and trying to understand how it's varied in time, or looking across the the domains of tactical and operational to strategic, I should say, environments. Uh, we're kind of talking about looking across time, and I don't necessarily know that it's always a valuable tool to do that because my thought is that for every every ounce more complexity we have, we have tools to manage that complexity. Uh, and the, the only thing I think is different we talk about all the time is the volatility concept, the speed of change as we describe it in this particular case. Uh, I think this is the one time in history where we have a much, much greater speed of change uh, and that volatility. Do you think that applies in this sense? Oh, it absolutely does. And I think yesterday's uh, discussion clearly highlighted the, the requirement on, and what I'll throw in a, a real curveball here and call it the cognitive domain. How do we prepare folks mentally to address the decision-making that's going to be required in the future because of that speed, because of that complexity? So a, a couple of the initiatives that we're working on, I'll just talk about them briefly. We can get in, into them into some detail. But Back in 2014, the chief of staff of the Army came here and, and had asked the commandant or made the statement that he didn't believe some of his strategic leaders could actually think strategically. And we've been on this chase, if you will, to try to say, how do we not only develop these folks, but how do we build a bench of these folks that can operate in the complexity that you just talked about? The, the effort really got kind of kicked off in 2014, and then 2016, we, st we stood up uh, Army University uh, Strategic Education Subcommittee, and, and we brought in about 52 folks, right? And this is all co cohorts, and we, we started by asking, what is strategic thinking? And we found out very quickly that neither the Army or the Joint Force had a definition, which is somewhat ironic because we say we want these guys. Research by Army Research Institute kind of proved the point that senior leaders didn't even know what the competencies were that made up this type of thinking that we're looking for. So this is a, a case where we want something, but we really can't articulate what it is. So we set off on, on trying to identify what strategic thinking is, and we, we defined it. And then we, we came back with the competencies and enablers, uh, the building blocks, if you will, to that. And when you, when you talk about thinking in time, which is what you had just mentioned, that is one of the key competencies we need to, to work on. The others, uh, comprehensive information gathering, action learning or lifelong learners, critical thinking, creative and innovative thinking, uh, and, and systems thinking, all of which is taught here. Now, now, quite frankly, the other part of the research showed that it's way too late. These, to develop these kind of abilities to think strategically it's a decade or more in most cases. So when you're looking for these leaders, we don't look here. We look somewhere left of, of uh, here, right? So the, a couple other things that came out of that work was we understood how much DOD and, and the Army depended upon the institutional domain to develop these things. And what we found really through the literature and, and the academic research was that most of your ability to think this way, the, the same way you described that we need leaders, really happens in the operational domain, what we call the crucible complexity, i.e. the real world, or in the self-development domain, which is, in, in my opinion, the most fertile ground to plow because it has become the trash can for everything, right? If, if, you, if operational leaders don't have time or we don't have time in school, we push it over to self-development and we say they'll figure it out. This cognitive development has to occur in all three of those domains. If you want the leaders that can operate in this complexity, we kind of have to get after it from day one. And I'm talking about a session into the Army and work through an entire career timeline. And I think one last thing I want to add to get at this, which is this is significantly different than what we've done in the past, is we're really looking for cognitive assessments at every level. We don't have them, right? So while you have a pretty good picture of who a leader is, what I'll call the whole right side of that profile, the cognitive, non-cognitive, and skills specific to that job, we're not assessing those. We're just bringing people in with the assumption that they'll figure it out. Rick, I think we're also bringing people in, though, with the assumption that they're going to be, you know, at the officer level, we're growing everyone for that same leadership spot at the top of the, at the, top of the pyramid. Um, 
granted, we may have different tracks of how we get there based on whatever our core job is. But that top of pyramid right now is is an O six or or an E seven, depending upon you know if you're an officer enlisted. And there's no differentiating and how you get there except you have to follow that leadership track, not the cognitive track, um, that can get us promoted because we have a system based off meritocracy. You know, however long that we serve and, and the jobs we have get us to a point where we get promoted, and um, you know that that cognitive ability will be critical to be assessed if you're going to continue to promote people based on uh, meritocracy or if you're going to change that system based off something else, off the assessments. Yeah, so I had, I had mentioned the Strategic Education Subcommittee work as one of the initiatives that I think was key to getting these, this, the leadership competencies developed. The second is the work that the Talent Management Task Force is doing, and this gets to your point directly. If we really value and we want to grow the cognitive capability, we have to reward it. And, and where the, the Talent Management Task Force is, is they're, they're designing a profile for each position. And some of the aspects or KSBs, knowledge, skills, and behaviors that define that profile would be in the cognitive side. Are you innovative? Are you creative? Can you think in time, as an example? What we see a future, or what we see in the future, is you will be competing at every level for a job. And this profile that will highlight your strengths and weaknesses, and this includes not only your experience and your education, but your cognitive and non-cognitive skills, you will not be eligible for certain jobs. It's just the way it's going to be. And, and quite frankly, you know, the, the army you talked about was an upper out army. I would characterize the work that the task force is looking at as more of a develop or out. You know who you want to be. You know what it's going to take to get there. We're going to put you in assignments that you can get there, but it's up to you. And I think one last point, we all kind of come into the service at a different level. Who you grew up with, where you grew up, how you grew up, how you were challenged, your, your cognitive abilities are unique to you. And I think that's the, the, the single most important thing that's going to go into the future. We're not all the same. We're never going to be all the same. We can't mass produce these folks. So we're going to have to look at you as a unique person, understand your strengths and weaknesses, and make you the best cognitive leader that we can be. And, and it may not be as good or it may be better than others. The Army, the military in general, I think has taken to a certain extent an approach where we're all, all leaders are Legos. You can click them in anywhere. They're basically the same shape. They fit. So you can take a leader from one place, put them in another place. Everything works pretty well. With a system like that, it works pretty well. Really, really good leaders will rise to the top however that happens. But in general, we have pretty good leadership at every level, and we have a great deal of flexibility. I think what we're looking at now is that individuals will develop individually, they will have individual skills, and they will fit very precisely into very precise slots. Now, the danger with that is, the, the pro of that is, we will save manpower, we'll have the right person in the right job, it will be a perfect fit, and we'll achieve the greatest success. The negative side of that is rarely do we as individuals in the military operate in a vacuum. So a leader is a good leader in part because that person has a good staff, because their leadership style matches with their staff. As a staff officer, I've had situations where I've excelled and where I excelled less. I was the same person, but the situation was different. The people I worked with were different. So if we have a Lego approach, we make a big block of Legos, and it can achieve any mission, but it's really big. Or we slim that down to the smallest number of Legos possible, but every piece has to fit exactly. I think with budget cuts, with changes, we're going to want a streamlined military. But the risk that that brings is that we operate as a whole, not as individuals. So we can develop individuals, but if we develop individuals that may not be a perfect match with the other individuals in a particular organization, that can, cause, that can create a less successful situation. So last question, we, we haven't even talked about it all. We keep talking about this anonymous senior leader in 2040. Where are those senior leaders right now in 2019? Yeah, th that, that's a really good point because if we're talking about the leaders in 2040, they're, they're in West Point right now. They're the privates coming into the Army. We're not talking about waiting to 2040. We're talking about right now. If we want these folks ready to deliver in the scenarios that we had mentioned yesterday, the development needs to start today. Sounds like you guys have some work to do to get this done in time, to get this uh, enacted pretty quickly. Uh, Our students are career. graduating in just <laughs> a few months, so that will be left to us here, the, the long-term faculty at the school. 
Well, there's a couple other initiatives that, that probably need um, a little bit of explanation so folks know that we are along this, this path. Within the officer cohort of the Army, we start at West Point and ROTC with a talent-based branching. And to establish a branch or to figure out where a potential cadet is going to go, they give them an assessment battery. At the end of that battery, they say, here's where you're best suited. So this generation, the one I just talked about, is already getting exposed to you are going to be uniquely treated. The captain's career course has started a captain's cognitive abilities test, which, again, is trying to look inside the metacognition part of the student to kind of understand not only how they think, but what they think about. Dr. Susan Martin here at the War College is working on a senior leader profile. This is probably the most groundbreaking of the three. A little bit biased because I, I work with her, but she's taking the approach that not one of these competencies standing alone really means anything. It's the combination that's unique to an individual. At the War College, we've had 82 or 87 students take it already. The unique thing for me and a, a, for, a former operations research guy, a numbers guy, when I look at her data, every officer is showing up a little bit different. Uh, probably most surprising to me, although it shouldn't be, when she got into creativity and innovation, we had students who, t who have taken this test that range from two standard deviations below the mean to two standard deviations above the mean. What does that mean? It's a wide variance. It's probably the wo most wide varied uh, variable that she looked at. Kind of ironic when we want these innovative and creative leaders, and we have students that really came out of this mold process. We produce them all the same. They're vastly different. I'm glad you threw Rotsi in there because otherwise I was going to get hate mail for not including all the – we'll throw OTS in there as well, please, because West Point isn't the only place we produce leaders. So right. we got to just get that straight. And we're also looking at uh, non-commissioned officers and leaders throughout the um, enterprise. So – all leaders will face similar challenges. We're not just looking at generals. We're looking at the War College does focus on the senior leader, but these elements will apply to leaders across the board. And we also look extensively at a concept called mission command, which is pushing these leadership decisions to the lowest level possible in a very simple sense. So leadership across the board will will be even more important in the future than it is today. Yeah, and we say mission command. We're talking about the philosophy of mission command, not necessarily the system of mission command, which could get confusing sometimes. I don't understand why the Army just doesn't call it a command and control system. That's another discussion for another day. Oh, Unfortunately, gentlemen, we're out of time for this episode. I want to thank you for coming in the studio. I want to thank the listeners for uh, joining us again today. Join us again for part three, where we'll try and put all of this together and tie a bow on it and understand what the possible recommendations are for this, for this issue. Thank you for coming in the studio, guys. Thanks thank for having us. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.